So welcome back everybody and welcome to the afternoon session on data analysis. We have some really interesting talks for you this afternoon. And our first speaker is Paula Cruz from the Statistical Office of Portugal. And she will talk to us about flash reports with flex dashboard for the characterization and quality levels of available data sets. Paula, the floor is yours. Okay, I'll start sharing the content. Okay, you're watching the, the presentation? Okay, so my name is Paulo Cruz. I work at uh, Statistics, I work at Statistics Portugal at the Information Infrastructure Unit. I have a master's degree in Information Management and I'm beginning, I'm in the beginning of a PhD in the same area. So I'll be presenting the use of Flex dashboard in the construction of flash reports for the characterization and quality levels of available data sets. So for several years now, uh, Statistics Portugal has been uh, developing flash reports for all uh, business surveys with a view to monitor the data collection process and analyze the main indicators associated to each statistical operation uh, and to each statistical operation specific needs. In a top-down approach, in this way, it's possible to identify the main trends right away and to focus the analysis of the data in, on the variables which are identified as being the most relevant. It is also possible to break down information by region, economic activity or any other distribution that is considered relevant. Uh, right now, one of our biggest challenges is to, mo to move into a more regular and efficient, efficient production of essential indicators with a reduced burden on respondents. And under the cooperation established with external organizations, such as the tax authority, a very significant volume of administrative data from various sources in, uh, is now internally available. In order to facilitate data analysis and exploration, the production and use of flash reports has also been adopted in this area. However, due, due to the volume and nature of the data in consideration, it was necessary to adopt new tools. The tools that were being used before were mainly Word and Excel. So uh, in terms of the, we decided to adopt um, our markdown uh, the, the package flex dashboard based on our markdown due to its ease of use and interactivity and also the fact that it's also an open source package. Within its main features, it is worth highlighting the following ones. The fact that it supports for a wide variety of components, uh, flexible and easy to implement layouts, uh, extensive support for text annotations, the possibility to create storyboard uh, layouts, the possibility to include a dynamic and scrollable HTML tables, uh, to export data in standard formats such as CSV, Excel and so on, to produce default dashboards as standard HTML documents that can be attached to an email or to be deployed in any server. Also, two major advantages of the uh, Flex dashboard are its ease of reuse and parameterization, which, in a, which, which makes it possible to create a new report quickly. I'm sorry. So, how does the uh, Flex dashboard work? Sorry, well, I'm not seeing the, the, the slides changing. Yes, we are all in the second slide. Mark, can you see what happens? Because it doesn't change the slide. Now we are in the slide five. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry. Were, in what slide were you? I was also watching the second slide, but it, the story was still clear for me. <laughs> okay, okay. So I'll go on. So um, uh, when I was starting to use Flex Dashboard, I I, I've, I've found that these two uh, links were very useful. I will try to demonstrate how to create um, a flex dashboard. Uh, 
Are you seeing the our studio? Okay. Yes, correctly. So, uh, in order, if you're using our studio, uh, you have to create a new file, um, a new R Markdown file. And uh, in order to go directly to the Flex Dashboard template, you choose uh, Flex Dashboard from the template. And then you untitled uh, default uh, uh, Flex Dashboard starts to being uh, filled. This is called the YAML section. Uh, which is the header section where you define the title of the, the document, the type of document, in this case it is a flex dashboard uh, presentation, the orientation, and vertical layout. Now, this, this defines the type of document and the layout of the document. In here you define the libraries that you want to include. The library flex dashboard is uh, included by default. And um, the shards or, or any other type of objects that you want to present. These are called, these gray areas are called code chunks, chunks. And in here, you can define the programming language that you want to use in each chunk. You can run each, each chunk separately to, to, down, to load data or to understand if the, the code is uh, going correct. In order to produce the document, you have to save it. If we click on it, it will ask to be saved. I'll call it something. So you have a, a blank dashboard, but it already has the, the layout that we have defined. You can also include some uh, some charts. I'm going to choose the library bigraphs. In uh, in relation to the code chunks, you can decide if you want to include the, the code the code chunk in the report or not. I'll be choosing the option in to to show this piece of of code and to include one graph. In here, I decide not to show the graph. If you can, you cannot. For some reason, you cannot include the graph in which you are working on. So I'll decide not to show this one, and then I'll show the last one without the associated code. I'm sorry, I saw, you see how this works. So it is easy to, relatively easy to build a chart. So the first chart appears with the code associated to it. The second chart doesn't appear because I decided to not include it. And the third chart appears without the associated code. So it's fairly easy to to create a flex dashboard document. So getting uh, back to the presentation, I de we decided to present an example of uh, the flash report, the first flash report that we started building, which related to the electronic invoice, the invoice data received from the tax authority. So I'll be showing you very quickly how the report is organized. Are you seeing the report? Okay. So this is a dummy report because these reports are only for internal use at Statistics Portugal right now. Uh, so we start by... I'm sorry. We start by... Uh, the, the report is organized into five different tabs, the ones you see here. The first one is an overview of, uh, of the data received uh, uh, from the tax authority. We do a trend analysis by year and month since 2018 in terms of the number of registers, taxable amount, average taxable amount, 
uh, the consumption by national uh, taxpayers and foreign uh, individuals. We also include a very rough initial analysis of the outliers that are found that were found in this period, over this period. This is an HTML dynamic table, so you can order this by the fields uh, that are in the head, header of the table. We then proceed with uh, an analysis of the reference month. In the header, we include the, the number of registers and the total taxable amount of the reference year. And then we proceed with a comparison with the monthly and year over year change rate of the number of registers in relation to the two previous months and to the two homologous months of the taxable amount of the. We also include an interportal range analysis of the consumption of by companies, individuals, for foreign individuals, and other um, taxpayers in terms of taxable amount. In order to understand what are the most relevant registers and companies, we also include the top hundred, the top hundred highest values by company, and by and we also and by the last uh, survey in which they have participated. So uh, we can see the amount, that, the total taxable amount that that company has reported in this year, and the latest uh, survey in which one of the latest surveys in which the company has participated. We also uh, showed the, the top hundred uh, the lowest uh, uh, amounts, also by company and by the last survey in which they have participated. We also run a comparison of the proportion that common uh, companies, that com uh, companies that are compen uh, common to both the previous and the reference month of the invoice data in order to understand if the proportion of these common companies, the companies that report in two uh, successive months, remains stable uh, in relation, remains uh, similar to the previous year. We also list the 50 biggest companies that report in the reference months, but not in the previous one, in order to understand if the data received in that particular month is complete or not. And we do the same thing in relation to the previous months. Uh, 50, 50 biggest companies which report in the, we have reported in the previous month, but are not reporting in the reference month to understand if the data is complete. Then on the third uh, step, we uh, perform a regional and sectoral characterization of the aggregate data, uh, break, broke down by the NAS. And uh, in the, pre the reference and previous month, and also we evaluate uh, the monthly and year over year uh, exchange rate. We do this uh, to, uh, to NAS, by NAS uh, sector, institutional sector, by type of market, if it, uh, basically if, uh, by national markets, eurozone market, non eurozone market, and other markets. And we also include a breakdown by nut nut tree region and by uh, cons uh, country of consumption in relation to consumption by foreigners. In the fourth tab, we include um, a comparison with the most relevant statistical operations involving business and companies. Basically, basically we compare the, the weight of the companies that are included in a certain business survey, that responded to a certain business survey, and that are also reporting in the, uh, to the, uh, within the invoice data in order to understand if how do they uh, compare to the total um, turnover, annual turnover that they have reported in a certain uh, survey. We also analyze how the, comp uh, the companies that are included in the invoice data and uh, in, the, in the business survey 
uh, how they how how the how they perform in relative terms in each uh, in each uh, operation in order to see if the both the survey and the uh, uh, tax authority data uh, have similar behaviors. So you can see here that the evolution is very similar in both uh, situations, in the invoice data and in the business survey uh, in consideration. We also try to understand companies that are uh, responding in a certain survey and, and are not reporting in the invoice data. So we do this for other operations. In the last tab, we include a technical note describing the original data received from the tax authority, um, their characteristics. And then we also include the data enrichment that we perform based on other data sets and, uh, and the reference universes. And we include this in the technical note. So you can see that the number of fields that are provided to the, to the areas that are going to work with the invoice data is much uh, bigger than the original data provided by the tax authority. So I continue with the presentation. I'm sorry. So I've already talked about this contents overview. So in terms of the uh, packages that we have used to construct this uh, flash report, so the main package was Flex dashboard. We also use R Oracle to connect to the to an Oracle database because uh, um, uh, the, the data is very uh, very uh, big to to be working in another uh, standards i should also mention that we are running the flash report on aggregate data and not directly on the monthly data that the tax authority uh, sends us we also use ggplot of course for data visualization it is this is the data table the dt package is also one of the most important that we use to build dynamic html tables and then uh, packages for dealing with the data frames and and reshaping the data and arranging uh, multiple grid based plot, plots so we decided to present some the, some important pieces of code. Uh, the first one is related to the connection to the Oracle database. So we have to define the host, the port, and then the connect string is built and uh, saved on this object con that will be used uh, in the, the in later on in the flash report. As I said, you can use various uh, programming languages, languages in a uh, flex, in flex dashboard, such as in Markdown. You have to define the language in here. In here, in this piece, I define we define the, the connection that I, I presented above, and this is the name of the object that it will result from this SQL query. This SQL query is running on a schema on a, an Oracle database that is identified here. You have to have, give permission uh, to, of reading to this uh, schema in order to generate this SQL query and obtain the pretended result. Paula, you have about two minutes. Two minutes, okay. So, so I also also, also include a multi-line chart uh, code, building a multi-line chart, uh, dynamic, the dynamic tables uh, that are presented in flash reports, a grouped bar plots, a box plot using ggplot on block sort of the value boxes that I presented in the earlier with the number of registers and the taxable amount of the reference month. The, a gauge in which we can measure, define the three regions of, uh, of success, uh, warning and danger, and to arrange graphs side by side. So the feedback from users was, internal users, was globally positive, resulting in the extension of this type of report to other administrative data sets. Some suggestions for improvement were made, such as the possibility to download contents, automated refresh, refreshing, internet publication, links to use data sets, among others. We have already provided the possibility to download contents. 
I haven't showed you, but we have. There are results. There are also some flash reports that are, that are being created, which already have some parameters uh, to avoid the man with the hard coding of the reference periods, for instance, they already uh, enabled the users to do automated refreshing of the data. As for limitations and future improvements, uh, currently reports are, uh, are restrict, restricted to internal users and a relative low, although important, number of datasets. However, we intend to extend its use and scope through the creation of a common template, which can be easily adapted to different datasets. And we are also considering to upgrade an upgrade to Shiny dashboard with a view to better meet user needs in terms of uh, interactivity and to be more autonomous in selecting the input variables and and to obtain and to obtain a more dynamic uh, type of report. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula. Um, I don't see a question in the chat. I have one. I have one question for you. What do you feel is the the most important limitation of on in Flex dashboards? Because you can also build a shiny application from from scratch, for example. Uh, we uh, right now the Flex dashboard responds to our needs. Uh, we don't see that uh, it presents limitations in relation to those needs. But we would like to understand uh, uh, how Shiny Dashboard uh, can uh, improve some of uh, the, the present Flex dashboards in terms of interactivity, for instance, in terms of uh, uh, enabling the user to select uh, the variables, the breakdown variables, for instance. And if we, if we, um, when we uh, develop uh, uh, more flexible uh, the flash report that can be easily adapted to other to other data sets, maybe through the use of Shiny Dashboard, we may let the users uh, choose the data set uh, that they want to explore, for instance. Okay, so more more flexibility, basically. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for your uh, very nice talk and for the very brave live coding. Um, our next speaker is uh, Fatih Tuzan. I hope I pronounced your name right. We'll okay. talk to us about determining the business cycle of Turkey. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, thanks. Okay, I'll share my screen. Can you see my uh, screen? Okay. Uh, and, uh, I want to start to first of all introduce myself. My name is Fatih Tuzan, and I have been working at the uh, Data Analyze Group of Methodology Department in Turkstat. I would, uh, today would like to present to you our study on determining Turkey's business cycle. First of all, I would like to uh, start the presentation by briefly talking about what the concept of business cycle is. Um, the business cycle is the periodic but irregular up and down movements in economic activity measured by fluctuations in real GDP and other macroeconomic variables. And this fluctuation process covers all the recession and expansion phases that occur from one peak to another peak or one through to another through. And a business cycle uh, is identified as a sequence of four phases. These are expansion, recession, depression, and recovery. And this process appears in the given order but is not periodic. Secondly, I want to talk about the turning points and turning points and the bribe and uh, bribe ocean procedure. Uh, we can define uh, the turning points as the peak and the true points in the economic activity. Uh, and we use bribe ocean algorithm to determine the uh, dates and the time intervals of turning points. And uh, the history of this algorithm is based on the work of Burns and Michel, 
uh, calculating peaks and truths uh, in 1946, and then it was translated into a computer algorithm uh, by Brian Bosch in 1971. Uh, Brian Bosch formulated it with computer codes using the business cycle criteria uh, determined by the National Bureau of Economic Research. And this algorithm has five assumptions. A peak must be followed by a true. A phase must have a, a duration at least two quarters. A cycle must have a duration of at least five quarters. Turning points are not be situated within the first or last two quarters of a time series. And the, uh, the first peak and true must be high respectively lower than values closer to beginning of the data series. Okay. Uh, our, could you could you please uh, could you zoom in a little bit because it's uh, on my screen it's a bit hard okay. to read. Uh, uh, did you see did you see clear? Yeah. yeah, that's that's better for me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, our aim of the study is uh, examining the basic characteristics of cyclical fluctuations uh, in the Turkish economy and uh, obtaining the turning points in the business cycles. And. Uh, I want. Uh, I would like to mention about the importance of this study. Uh, we divide it into three parts. The first one is updating the studies in the national field due to being outdated. Uh, since the studies conducted in the national field are in the past, uh, the data used in this study make an important contribution to the literature as it covers a long period and is up to date. Uh, the second one is uh, obtaining the main part of the real part of this is obtaining the cycle component for the Turkey business cycle uh, monitor tool. Uh, as Turk starts, we continue to work on the business cycle monitor tool, and this tool facilitates the analysis of medium term economic developments. Uh, and for this tool, uh, we need the cycle component of time series, and we adopted the deviation business cycle approach in order to uh, get cycle and we use uh, modified Audrey Prescott filter method to estimate the uh, distribution business cycle component. And Audrey Prescott has a parameter called the smoothing parameter, and it's calculated cy uh, cycle length for US is eight years. But uh, although this length seems acceptable for business cycles in developed countries, the studies for developing countries show that cycle lengths is, are shorter in these countries, for example, in Turkey. A second year period does not reflect the reality for Turkey. Uh, because of the situations, we need to determine the cycle period for Turkey. Uh, and the last one is uh, using the not the GDP data, uh, because we release the GDP as quarterly frequencies, like in other countries. And in the studies carried out so far within the scope, GDP data were used with quarterly frequencies. We use not the GDP data to determine the cycle duration and this adds a special feature to this study uh, and i will explain how we obtain the monthly gdp uh, in the next section here we are our course and the operation process uh, in our study we use three different macroeconomic variables uh, the quarterly GDP data, monthly IPI industrial production index, uh, and the uh, monthly GDP data. And quarterly GDP is between uh, the first quarter of 1987 and the second quarter of 2021. And monthly IPI is between the first month of 1986 and the sixth month of 2021. Uh, in addition, by using the IPI as a regression variable, regression variable, uh, the GDP was disaggregated in the monthly series. And uh, we use monthly GDP as a third series to determine cycle. And in order to obtain monthly GDP, we used Chowlin uh, mean RSS echo trim method to, uh, for temporal disaggregation. And this method is one of the most common methods and used in period composition. And also, we need the uh, trans cycle components to do this. Uh, we use Tramosis approach to obtain the trans cycle component by using RG Demetra package TDNR. Uh, and RG Demetra is an R interface to G Demetra Plus. Uh, it is a, a system adjustment software 
officially recommended to the members of the European statistical system and the European system uh, of central banks. And uh, we can talk about our results now uh, in three parts. First, uh, I want to talk about quarterly GDP results. Uh, in the graph, uh, the red dot lines shows the true points and uh, green dot, dot lines uh, green dot lines show the peaks uh, as you see in the graph graph you can for uh, you can see four full business cycles uh, in terms of the periods covered by data used and uh, average expansion period is uh, 26.5 quarters before uh, this, uh, I want to talk about the recession points of the graph. The first recession point is observed in the first quarter of 1989 here. And after the uh, monetary crisis in the third quarter of 2001, the Turkish economy entered uh, a long period of expansion. And Turkey was also under the influence of global economic crisis that emerged in the last months of 2008. Uh, and the, low, uh, the lowest point was the foreign exchange, foreign exchange and debt crisis, which was effective in the last quarter of 2018. Uh, in this period, Turkish lira depreciated significantly, like in the last days. Uh, and uh, let's look at the table. Uh, there are expansion and recession points, start points and end points you can see from the table. Uh, according to the results from the table, average expansion period uh, is uh, 26.5 quarters, the session period is uh, 3.4 uh, quarters, and expansion period is approximately eight times longer than the average session period. And this means uh, this is an expected result for uh, developing, countries, developing countries' economy. Also, low average uh, recession period indicates that Turkey has come out of the crisis quickly. Uh, you can see here the recession periods are lower, but expansion periods are uh, bigger. And uh, the average cycle length in terms of peaks, 30 point, 30 point 25 quarters, and for truth is uh, 29.75 quarters. And uh, according to the for both peaks and truths, we can say that the cycle is about 7.5 years. The secondly, uh, the monthly GDP results, there are six uh, full uh, business cycles were observed in terms of truth. And uh, in addition to the results obtained from the quarterly GDP data, Prices were also detected in 1991 and 1994. Uh, Turkey felt the Gulf crisis that started the late 1990s for seven months, and the economic crisis that started in the middle of the 1993 for about a year. Uh, we found that um, Average expansion time is 44.6 months, and recession period, average recession period is 11.3 months. And we can say that the average expansion period is approximately four times longer than the average recession period, like in the results of quarterly GDP. And the average cycle length obtained from the both peak and true were uh, calculated as close to each other. Uh, every cycle length for peaks 55.5 months, and every cycle length for throws is 59.33 months. And we can say that the average duration of cycle, the cycle is about five years. And lastly, uh, I want to talk about the monthly IPI results. Uh, there are five full business cycles. Uh, according to, uh, unlike the uh, monthly GDP results, the crisis in 1991 was not detected here. Uh, the average expansion period is approximately five times longer than the average recession periods. Um, 
and the average cycle length in terms of peaks uh, is uh, 64 point 66 months and for throws is 72 point four months and as a result of average duration of cycle is about 5.5 years we can say and uh, as a result of the analysis made with three different data uh, we have three uh, we have different cycle lengths and therefore we need to uh, make an assessment of which cycle duration should be used we can make the evaluation from two aspects. The first is the frequency of the series, and the second is how much it affects the changes in Turkish economy. And quarterly, quarter frequency data make it difficult to follow the timing of moments of economic activity, but monthly series allow the determination of cycles to be more clearly revealed in terms of clear changes. And also, monthly GDP data is thought to be better reflect the crisis periods that Turkey has experienced. Also, uh, the monthly IPI series represents, represents only a certain part of the economy, but GDP covers the entire economy. And as a result of these evaluations, uh, we decided to use uh, monthly GDP results, and we can say that the Turkey's cycle is about five years. And finally, uh, we did determine five-year cycle. Uh, we filtered the cycle component, and we uh, we compared the cycle component uh, to the eight-year cycle, 96-month cycle that's proposed by Hotel Pesco for the U.S. economy. And uh, you can see the, from the graph uh, and take the standard values of these cycles. And uh, according to standard values of the cycles, the five-year cycle has less volatility. And uh, we can see the low volatility uh, from the graph. Uh, the red line is five-year cycle, and the blue line is uh, six-year cycle. And lastly, I want to talk about our, uh, we use our packages, some our packages for data importing cell. And uh, for data manipulation, uh, Deployer, TIDR, and Zoo packages we use. Uh, for temporal desegregation, we use TempliSec package. Um, and we get the peak and the true points with uh, BC dating package. And uh, to filter, uh, to extract the cycle component from trans cycle, we use unfiltered package. There are some filtering methods in this package. And we use ggplot2 and interact for interactive resolution, we use plotly packages. And lastly, we use our markdown for reporting and presentation. Uh, here are references. And thank you very much. That's yes, so. Thank you for a very interesting analysis of the business cycle. Um, is there, I don't see a question in the chat, but if anybody wants to ask a question still, then there's time for that. Otherwise I have a, well, I have a couple of questions, but maybe one very practical question is, do you have, is this code uh, available somewhere? Because I can imagine that uh, maybe people would like to repeat it um, uh, okay. for another country or other data. Uh, we can share it. Uh, here our code is here, and uh, we can share the uh, HTML file, uh, and you can find the code here. Yes, that would that would be great. Thank you. From the start of the nice workflow from reading to analysis, and uh, um, let's see. Yeah, I uh, one one thing that struck me in the analysis is that uh, in uh, the GDP you saw a crisis in 1991. Yes. If, I, if I remember correctly, and in the IPI, you did not see it. Is there um, like a, a reason, economical reason, for why you don't see that? or Maybe the, uh, in that period, uh, the, uh, there was a problem of the data because uh, very old time data, uh, we need to backcast the data from uh, 1998 to the 18, uh, 1987. Uh, Maybe uh, there was a uh, problem there uh, in this period, 
and data can couldn't catch the uh, crisis. And uh, also, uh, it depends on the uh, setting the parameters uh, about PC dating package. If you want to uh, catch more uh, crisis, uh, more faces, uh, you need to set it uh, the higher uh, numbers, for example. Uh, it depends on uh, a bit uh, the uh, use of parameters again. Yeah. Uh, it's also a bit of definition when you call something a crisis, uh, I guess. Okay, thank you very much again. Uh, our next presenter is from our host country, Romania. Uh, Marius Jula will tell us about using R to determine the impact of an image on viewers. Hello, thank you. We cannot hear you, uh, Marius. Or maybe it's just me. You can hear me now? No? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, technology hopefully will help us to you know, transmit information properly. Okay. So, uh, uh, can you see my presentation? Okay, thank you. So, uh, I'm going to present you. Um, the a beginning of a study, I hope it will uh, finish uh, with uh, an app, maybe a shiny app. And uh, what I'm trying to do in this, um, in this study, I'm trying to determine how different aspects of uh, images have impact on viewers. What I mean by that, I mean that I will try to identify main aspects of uh, images, like uh, technical details, but not only, uh, that are, are mostly likely to uh, create a high impact on target audience. Uh, why I think this is an interesting, uh, uh, an interesting good tool or in interesting instrument. And now we are uh, facing a lot of uh, social media platforms that are bombing us with a lot of images. We know that uh, an average person sees every day hundreds, uh, if not thousands of images. And uh, the question is, what make us tick? What make us click the like button? What make uh, want to uh, see that image or to see that uh, uh, an image like that. What aspects of an image make us uh, linger more than two seconds on that page, on that particular page? And uh, when talking about photography, I learned that uh, and a lot of persons uh, in the field uh, may approve it or not, <laughs> or maybe disapprove, that um, you know, painting and photography have a common ground. I'm not going to bore you with the details about uh, old paintings and the, the rules in paintings and photography, but for sure there are some uh, important aspects that can be uh, bothly, uh, bothly uh, applicable to paintings and photography. And uh, the question I start from is what makes a good painting? And uh, well, if we refer to a good painting, we may refer to technical aspects, emotions, and novelty. These are the three main categories that are um, defined as uh, having an impact of on a painting. Uh, starting from this, uh, we are moving to what creates or what makes a good uh, photo. Uh, and um, according to different sources, there are um, at least seven basic elements uh, in uh, photographic art, so to say, that can be uh, regarded as uh, aspects of good or great photos. 
and we have to look to lines, shapes, forms, textures, color, size, and depth. I emphasize the, the, the aspect color because uh, it will be uh, tonight my main uh, aspect. I will uh, focus on this aspect and uh, I will present you my results based on colors in photography. So, starting with the uh, uh, Webster Dictionary, what does this color in photography mean? And I selected uh, uh, the the definition that uh, helps my presentation. So, uh, we are talking about a specific combination of hue, saturation, lightness, or brightness. When we are referring to these uh, three aspects, um, uh, these three aspects create a special mood in that photo. And I want to identify if this mood created by different propor proportion of different colors really have an impact on uh, the possible likability of that photo. And uh, looking uh, in uh, available uh, uh, references, uh, we can uh, select some aspects like uh, uh, muted colors may uh, create a specific feeling. Uh, it is better to use harmonic colors or to highlight the subject that you want to enhance. Besides this, there are also some hypotheses that uh, uh, are uh, according to uh, some uh, studies on the internet, uh, especially on social media, on Instagram. Uh, these hypotheses test uh, some, uh, some aspects, like, for example, the lighter the image, the more likes you get. 24% more likes if you have a lighter image. If you get Um, when uh, trying to... Marius? Yes? Uh, your connection was failing for about 15 seconds, so maybe you can discuss the previous uh, slide again. Previous slide, okay, here? Yes, thank you. Okay, sorry. Sorry, I'm on wireless and hope I hope that this will work from this now. So, um, I, um, uh, I started from uh, some hypotheses. Uh, especially related to social media like Instagram, where um, we can um, uh, see that um, uh, there are some aspects that will make the image more likable. And uh, these aspects uh, are related to uh, the color, light of the image, 24% more likes, background using the bluish colors, low saturation, and very important high textures. So, uh, when uh, starting uh, the analysis, um, uh, I found out that there are a lot of changes. And especially when uh, selecting the sample, uh, meeting the jitteris paribus conditions is not very simple. Because when analyzing different accounts, you will get different numbers of followers, different audience, and um, uh, another, another very important aspect uh, that I noticed, uh, uh, it's very important, the time of the posting when you upload your photo, the time and the day when you upload the photo. A lot of these uh, elements are um, controlled by um, um, social, uh, platform, social, social media platforms. And the algorithm of displaying uh, images, both in general, is in uh, a continuous change. So using uh, samples uh, that are uh, uh, extending on a, long, on a long period of time is not a solution because, um, because of these changes. 
Also, there are um, um, issues when um, um, images and posts uh, with the so-called hot topics are displayed, and this also affects the numbers of uh, likes that uh, uh, those pictures get. First hypothesis that I've tested is the color distribution. Uh, and if this color distribution influences the number of likes, uh, I uh, used the uh, R packages called distance and count colors, and the sample was of uh, 62 images. Now it's a small sample, but I wanted to use the same number of followers and uh, uh, as short uh, uh, period of time as possible, not to take into account the changes in display algorithm. And uh, based on this, uh, this sample, uh, we get an average of 143 likes per image, uh, meaning uh, almost the threshold of 5% that is considered a good, uh, good uh, ratio uh, of likes um, on, uh, on this social platform. Uh, I've started with uh, the simplest model, a linear model, using uh, these uh, three colors, the main colors, the basic colors that um, uh, create that create an image that is displayed on our uh, display, the RGB uh, system, and um, I get some promising results. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, R squared is. Uh, too little to, uh, to have a usable model. Next, uh, I'll uh, try to, uh, to uh, work on the, to tweak the algorithm to uh, identify uh, colors based on um, um, a different approach to uh, use um, um, the color distance based on the uh, colors and the very similar nuances and the hues of that color in order to, uh, to create a more reliable uh, model. Also, the next uh, step I took is to use object detection. I started with the hypothesis that using um, uh, um, impactful objects in your image may improve your chances to, to get likes. And uh, this uh, um, time yellow package uh, is very interesting in detecting uh, the different objects. So my next step is to include a larger sample in the analysis and see if different type object uh, influences uh, influence the number of likes. Also, this uh, algorithm uh, should be tweaked accordingly, as you see in the second image, uh, this object detection uh, package uh, detects uh, two persons in this image. I have the person behind the, um, uh, the bicycle and uh, it detects as two persons, the face and the full body. So um, uh, this, uh, this aspect should be addressed uh, in the in the next version of, uh, of um, the algorithm. Uh, as next steps, I want to uh, improve uh, the prediction model using all images and on different accounts. And I uh, want to take into consideration all, uh, also uh, different accounts with different number of followers and different audiences. Those so, um, usually uh, social media uh, um, um, accounts with a lot of followers are creating a sort of um, habit of using um, a kind of image, um, uh, same uh, same subjects, same uh, uh, same colors, uh, something like that. And I want to test if audience is reacting only on the uh, subjects that are used to and how they react to posts that are, so to say, outliers, images that are displaying different content that they are used to uh, on that um, particular account. 
Um, also, uh, I want to test a lot of more parameters, uh, uh, quantitative and qualitative parameters of the image, starting with the subjects, composition, uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, of course, to test uh, the results on different platforms, not only on social media. Uh, maybe it will be a good idea to test on platforms that are not changing the display algorithm so, uh, uh, um, so fast to have um, to, can, uh, to be able to use longer, uh, uh, longer samples. And uh, here are the references of the main packages I've used to, to analyze the images. And uh, thank you for uh, your attention. If you have any questions, I will be more than glad to answer. Thank you, Marius. A very interesting, interesting topic. Um, are there any questions from the audience? I don't see a question in the chat yet. Can I ask something directly? Yeah, sure. Sure. Uh, so thank you for the presentation. It's interesting work. I just had an idea um, for for input. Um, there's a there are sites that I, I know one of because I'm a member of, which is called Guru Shots. Oh yes, I know it. <laughs> so it's just based. So it's it's more. It's closer to your setup, I would say. So they, they have contests and you vote for pictures and then you could only use, like you, you could use the number of votes there and they kind of take care of the problem that photos are, have different number of views and, and, and things like that. So that would be the idea how you could make your life easier, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I know that uh, site. Thank you for your uh, suggestion. Uh, the problem with that site is um, uh, now they change also the algorithm and they are creating like games and it's more like a game and not uh, you're not uh, getting any more likes for uh, the quality of your photo. So um, it, it is a little bit difficult to, to also to take into consideration that you get likes from your teammates and it's like a, it's like a competition not uh, not based only on your uh, quality of on the quality of your photo but yes uh, we, it's a huge database with images and uh, yeah uh, it might be a good idea to test and validate my my models okay thank you thank you i see uh, jan van der laan um, has a question uh, he asked why did you choose r i think especially for the object detection because usually these kind of analysis are done in Python. The P word has now been dropped in the R conference. <laughs> yeah, I don't know really how to answer. Maybe the honest answer is I don't know Python. So I uh, use the programming language that I'm familiar with. So yeah, um, maybe, maybe Python is also offering a lot of tools, but uh, uh, this is uh, for now uh, my go-to programming language. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I I have one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's okay, Jan. He says he's sorry. <laughs> no so problem. just just one one uh, question from uh, my side. Uh, so you did a, a fit on likability using uh, RGB um, as uh, yes. predictors. Um, would it be make also sense? to use the hue saturation brightness as a scale, because these, uh, I think, are more close to how we perceive colors. Yes, this is um, um, one next step is, uh, I, I think the very next step is to, to use uh, these ones. That's, uh, I also mentioned those uh, aspects because indeed, uh, I uh, mentioned in the previous slide that uh, um, hue and saturation have a high impact on uh, how the people react. So yes, I'll try this. I'll try this and to improve and to see if I get uh, I get uh, uh, statistically significant estimators using those uh, those variables too. Of course. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you once again, Marius. Um, please um, stop sharing the screen. We have one uh, lightning talk by Michaela Sandu. Michaela Cornelia Sandu, are you there? Or is Irina Virginia? Or anybody else here to give the lightning talk on determinants of house price in Europe? Okay, apparently they couldn't make it. Yes, Mark, I have just checked the list of participants and I see they didn't connect. Okay. Well, in that so, case, yeah. we're going to, uh, I, uh, I propose that we close exactly on time, 16.15, not uh, due to me. Uh, so thank you everybody once again for joining and I uh, hope to see you all tomorrow morning for the keynote of Edwin Dio. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye.